Come with me to Nerdland for a little book discussion. The author, Princeton professor Martin Gillens. The title, Why Americans Hate Welfare. The data, more than a decade of public opinion surveys conducted by nonpartisan academic researchers. The results, Americans support spending for the social good, including social security, education, and assistance for the poor. At the same time, they oppose, often vehemently, the same kind of spending when it's called welfare. The puzzle, why do Americans support helping the poor but oppose welfare, which is the primary vehicle of spending to help the poor? The answer, according to Gillens, is that it's not due to individualism. It's not due to economic self-interest. Nope. Turns out that Americans hate welfare because media, at the behest of conservative politicians, have relentlessly linked welfare with black people and have hammered home the idea that welfare recipients are undeserving. And here's the kicker. Gillens did this analysis on data collected 20 years ago. So when Gingrich, Ryan, and Romney stoked the fires of racial resentment with their welfare misinformation campaign, it is nothing new. Joining me again are syndicated columnist Bob Franken, comedian and CBS Sunday Morning contributor Nancy Giles, Wake Forest professor David Coates, and business finance expert Monica Metha. It's lovely, again, to have you guys here, and I got to I got to tell you, when I hear them do the lies about welfare, and this is a not true about welfare, it just looks to me like the 20 years of race baiting that's been going on around it. But did you watch the, uh, the audience in the convention? When, I was intrigued by when people got very excited and clapped and when they didn't. And when Jeb Bush got up there and talked about ed funding education for all minorities, relatively quiet, when he got up there and, and had that young teacher saying we need more money, very quiet. As soon as he mentioned bashing teacher unions, and also when he said, let's have choice, the place erupted because choice means getting away, leaving the poor behind. And I think that's the philosophical debate we need to have about how you solve poverty by raising everybody or by escaping from people. Hmm. And this party wanted to escape, make, I think. You make such, such a good point, I think. I think that this is really under an umbrella of, of uh, efforts to discredit a constituency that probably isn't going to vote for the Republican Party. To me, the most contemptible is what they're trying to do to voter rights. Uh, in in yeah, states like right. Texas and all this kind of stuff, they are getting to the heart they are talking about disenfranchising yep. Americans who would not have the one man or in today's some one person, one vote availability. That goes to the heart of democracy. So you have a Republican Party, or at least many representatives of it, mm -hmm. who are not just anti-Democrat, they are anti-democracy. Mm -hmm. There is no other way to put it. And to jump on your point, I think what, what's so weird is that the only kind of voter mischief, if you want to call it, that had occurred, because there's statistically not a reason really to be going after voter fraud, in my opinion, was the 2000 election, when all those votes were purged from Florida, and all those people weren't allowed, and the votes that weren't counted, and that ended up in uh, a happy result for a Republican president. And voting is just such a basic human right. To have that taken away is... Yeah, so coming back to the issue of welfare, I think the, the problem I have with a lot of things that are being said here is that it's suggesting that the people who want to see a level of reform hate people that need welfare or, or require assistance. And I think to a certain extent, every civilized society should help the people that need the help. I think the question is just how much and for how long right, so and should it be limited? So much, wait, wait, wait. I want to be completely clear about this because I do think that, that uh, as an African American in this position, mm -hmm. I pretty frequently get called a race baiter and told that I am saying that other people hate someone. I am in no way saying anything about what people feel in their hearts about some individual. What I'm suggesting is that on a matter of policy, if we say assistance for the poor, that Americans have generally been big-hearted people who would like to help poor people. But when we say welfare, after 20 years of linking the word welfare with a group of people who we consider not only black, but also black and undeserving, mm -hmm. and the kinds of narratives that have, that have been created with that, there, is, there was reform in the system, reform that was so powerfully problematic that we didn't get enough money to poor people during this, and they are not telling the truth about President Obama. Well, well, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan <laughs> said that we, we, you know, we fought the war on poverty and poverty won. We didn't. We, when we fought the war on poverty, poverty went down. They stopped yes. fighting the war on poverty. The that was a crucial shift. That that we, there are people out there who, who are taking welfare and you know they need it, and then there are, there's other people out there who are taking welfare and could easily turn it away. There's all sorts of people in the 
the world. And I think the problem is that we have limited resources and we're trying to figure out how to make the best of those resources. That's the actual that, debate. You know, there's a weird assumption that people that take public assistance really want it. Exactly. You know, they're lazy. I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting they want it, but it, it can't most be people limitless. Want, uh, no one is limitless. suggesting that it's limited. Oh, the, li no. the limits currently, that, that let me be really clear, were established under Bill Clinton, yeah. under a Democratic mm. president, That's right. or what entitlements are we getting rid of? Every time we make an entitlement, we come up with one to make two reasons why we can't get rid of that. The entitlement like uh, yes, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Speaking to Monica's point early, yeah. that you have to have reform of uh, welfare. You need to have it tightened up. Guess who was the last person to do that? Yeah, well, Barack Obama. <laughs> when, the, when the very programs that uh, the Republicans are now attacking were really an effort to go to the governors and say, yep. you need to, in fact, increase things by 20%. That was the reform tightening up of the kind that you're talking about. And that's about the reform that they're twisting it. But that now they're twisting it. We get back to the Ministry of Truth. Right. Monica referred to the entitlement culture. There is an entitlement culture in this society, and it's at the top. Yeah. People get very, very angry if, you get, if they don't get their tax breaks, but they get very, very angry if people at the bottom get a little bit of help. It's as though this double standard. You give money to people who've already got some more money than they know what to do with, and that would generate good things. And this is and, where and I get so confused. Get so How angry, is it that most people aren't more angry about that? Yep. and want to pile on the people that are the most vulnerable. The, 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 I don't the, 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 the top 5% of taxpayers well, pay 40% of okay, taxes. Okay, I, I, I want to so listen, I wanna listen like, to what we're getting I want to listen to a moment to, to Mitt Romney, who did make this interesting point about what people deserve, because I want to play this, so we can play with this a little bit. Let's listen to Mitt Romney at the convention. Now is the moment when we can stand up and say, I'm an American. I make my destiny. We deserve better. My children deserve better. My family deserves better. My country deserves better. So he goes right to your point of deservedness. And just before that, he'd done this whole riff on people who work, you know, multiple jobs and college he, kids. He does this reversal. Yeah. So what he does is he, he, he says that if we start to talk about progressive taxation, we are setting Americans against Americans. What sets Americans against Americans is massive income inequality. <laughs> and we're actually pulling them together. It's part of this classic problem, uh, thing that went on last week of victims being turned into the cause of their own suffering. And the people who do cause the suffering being let off scot-free. Uh, the, the, it's quite clear that the people at the convention understood the importance of class. They kept demonstrating how they left it behind. It was like that Monty Python sketch of the four people wow. sitting around saying, oh, you lived in a hole in the ground kind of thing. So they understand in one sense that class and deprivation stop people doing things. But on the other hand, if we point it out and suggest maybe a little bit of social engineering rather than market-based engineering, we are accused of dividing America well, rather than pulling it, does, it together. It does feel to me like what they caught that was right about class, it does feel to me as incredibly part of the American story, is class mobility. If there's no class mobility, we are not America, right? right? I mean, they, like, I mean. So I feel like both conservatives you, and you progressives. Would, and, and, and I was going to say, and the data now shows that in our that in our current moment, class mobility is very low. And this notion of saying I deserve it, what do I deserve? I just feel like from the bottom, you you have to be able to say I deserve the ability for class mobility, which is funded by public education, mm -hmm. by low At cost health care, by and this is which is, is weird. enabled by taking risks. And that was the big thing that was missing from the what is no that. What is riskier than living poor in America? Seriously, what in the world is riskier than being a poor person in America? I live in a neighborhood where people are shot on my street corner. I live in a neighborhood where people have to figure out how to get their kid into school because maybe it'll be a good school and maybe it won't. I am sick of the idea that being wealthy is risky. No, there is a huge safety net that whenever you fail, will catch you and catch you and catch you. Being poor is what is risky. Is we so have lively. to create a safety net for for poor people, and when we won't because they happen to look different from us, it it, it is the pervasive well, ugliness. It is. Well, there's, there's this other side. There is, do that. There's the other side that, in fact, people, small businesses do take risk, of course, and that when we need That's a public policy. That's what makes that. entrepreneurs different but, from other smart, but, hardworking but people. And my point was that was what's missing from the speech. <laughs> You mean the entrepreneurs who built things all by themselves? They don't build them by themselves. They build yes, them by employing the other people. Yes, the ones that use the roads that all of but us you know have what? access to, that the I teachers have this. access to. But some of us go to Dairy Queen and some of us start I'm businesses. I'm sorry, but you know, the whole notion of job creators, consumers are job creators. We're the ones who make, who help make business and who help make industry. And it, it's very hurtful. I, I so agree with what you just said. There was a picture on the front page of the New York Times this Tuesday that really irked me. It was, it was a black man that was in a shelter in New Orleans. Orleans, 
and it, they showed empty beds around him, and he was laying back with his feet crossed. And there was something about that picture to me that just looked like this is an example of some lazy person sponging off the largesse yeah, of other I just, people. I, there are these pervasive things that are out there. They just which, are. Besides which, your premise, correct me if you disagree, your premise is, is that uh, the person must be able to have all the wealth he can accumulate, all the wealth he can accumulate as a reward for taking risks. And I guess my question is, how many vacation homes do you need? How many private jets do you need? I suspect that if people were to give a little bit back to the government that enabled them that they would, in fact, still want to take those risks. I don't think that's the thought process of the small business owner that makes $250,000 a year. We've lost 220,000 small businesses in the last 10 years. We're, we're mixing apples and oranges. We're talking about people that are super wealthy and putting sure. putting the policies that should sure. affect them on small, real people small, who small are just business. trying. You're right. Small business is, is, different, is different than being um, apples. But, I, but I'll small also small say business. 10 years, President Obama has been president less than few, but less than four. In just a moment, I'm going to take a breath, but first it's time for Weekend with Alex Witt. Alex